So, Brother Howard, yeah, whatever you did the first time, it, kept, it seemed like it was a delay coming out. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. It's been quite a morning already, but it's going to get better and better because God is on our side. Amen. Satan might be busy, but God overrules and overrides all of that. It's good to see so many of you already joining in. Some people are just getting their notifications. And if you got our newsletter this past weekend, here's a perfect example that you could be now an electronic evangelist. We're going to ask first that you sign on with a like or a love, and then if you will share, uh, so as many people, your family and friends, they probably already watched another service, and so they can tune into our service today because we got a great service planned for you. And maybe that's why uh, all the mechanisms was at work in order to stop it, but no weapon formed against us can be able to prosper. So, good morning. Welcome to our New Bethel AME Church family this morning. Uh, with, this is our communion Sunday. Most of you got your communion kits already. If you don't have a communion kit, not to worry. Get you some uh, light bread and Kool-Aid. Get you some uh, crackers and juice. Get you some uh, cone bread and buttermilk. We're going we're gonna to bless whatever you got at home. Amen. All right. Second thing. Um, I mentioned the uh, newsletter. Uh, we got a lot of information packed in the newsletter this week, so go ahead and take a look at that. If you're not privy to the newsletter, at the end of the service, we'll have uh, uh, a number that you could type in newsletter, and you'll be able to receive that newsletter with your email address. All right? Remember Bible study uh, in our prayer session on Thursday, and uh, that's really taken off wonderfully for us. Uh, we ask if you're going to grow in the Lord, uh, that you also study God's word. Amen. All right. On next Sunday, we got our youth coming up on next Sunday. Our youth, uh, and they're going to be doing uh, the worship service that's actually for the pastor's uh, anniversary, the pastor's appreciation. That's going to be next Sunday, so we're going to have a good time in the name of the Lord. Our good friend and brother, his birthday is today, too, is... Uh, presiding elder Tony DeMarco Hansberry. He'll be with us on next week for our pastor's anniversary celebration. Amen. Uh, she's been back for two weeks now, and I have not mentioned it, but Carol and Harden, uh, good to see you back in town. I know you've been worshiping with us from out in Kansas, so now you're back here to worship with us at home. We're glad to have you back home. Got a couple of birthdays that I missed. <laughs> Daniela Curry, she's one of my praise, she's going to be on the praise team one day because she already prays it at home when the pastor is up preaching. So, Daniela, happy first birthday to you. We missed that one. Reginald Campbell, he's a faithful follower on 
Uh, our virtual church, Reginald Campbell birthday uh, was last week as well. And then I believe today, uh, Christiane Caldwell, if you're watching, happy birthday. And uh, Jawan Davis' birthday is a day. And then uh, Meredith Trammell birthday, I believe, is on uh, tomorrow. And then also uh, Sister Lizzie Figgis' birthday is tomorrow, but we partying today. We partying like at night. Oh, y'all don't know that song. Anyway, <laughs> we're going to have a drive through uh, party. This is 87 years for the mo a beautiful lady and a beautiful spirit. We're going to be partying at 215, I'm sorry, yeah, 215 Chalk Street. It's going to be at 4 p.m., 4 p.m. We're having a drive through birthday party for uh, Sister Lizzie Figures. Amen. All right, I got to say this because it's so important because, as you know, uh, the Congress uh, and um, our governmental officials, they are allowing uh, the rental assistance as well as the utility assistance programs to lapse. But don't worry, you could still take advantage of the money that's already been given to our state. I'm going to tell you how to do that. Um, you're going to need to, oh, I got some first responders already on. If my first responders, if you will type in www.ourflorida.com. Again, www.ourflorida, one word, dot com. They'll be able to help you out with rental assistance. The money is already there. So uh, before your landlord try to kick you out, you need to go to the website, sign up, because they come on a, they're doing it on a first-come, first-served basis. All right. Again, OurFlorida.com. OurFlorida.com. All right. Very good. All right. I believe now uh, we're going to transition, I believe, to the prayer. And a good friend of mine and brother, Ephraim Bryant, going to pray the prayer. And then I believe our choir uh, is going to sing a song, Run and Tell That. Amen. And uh, then they'll come back to me. Get your tithe and offering ready. Uh, I'm not sure if we're going to be able to show that on the screen today, but it doesn't matter. You know what it is, and I'm going to tell you anyway. <laughs> Amen. All right. Ephraim Bryant uh, with our prayer. Father, I stretch my hands to thee. No other help I know. If thou would draw thyself from me, or whether shall I go? Must Jesus bear the cross alone, and all the world go free? No, there's a cross for everyone, and certainly there's a cross for me. It's once more and again, our Heavenly Father, that your servant is bowed at the footstool of mercy one more time. Lord, as I bow this morning, I bow for no form or fashion or no outside show to the world. I bow this morning because you woke me up this morning. For that cause, I'm begging thee to have mercy. I bow this morning, our Heavenly Father, because you started me on my way. For that cause, we're begging thee to have mercy. Lord, I bow this morning because you've given me the mind to serve and praise your holy name. For that cause, I'm begging thee to have mercy. Oh, Lord, ask that you would bless this service today, Heavenly Father. Bless it from the beginning to the ending. Lord, we know if you stop by, although it might be a different way that we're having service, Heavenly Father, that everything will be all right. For that cause, we're begging thee to have mercy. Lord, bless those that are sick this morning, Heavenly Father. Be a doctor for them, for we know that you are the great physician. Lord, there are many who have gone astray, Heavenly Father, this morning, but we know that you can bring them back to the fold. And Lord, there are so many in bereavement this morning, Heavenly Father. We ask that you would be a great consolator for them, for we know that you have all power in your hand. Lord, if we had 10,000 tongues, we wouldn't have enough to praise your holy name this morning. And Lord, we just want to thank you again because you've been so good. You've been so kind. You've been so merciful. For that cause, I'm begging thee to have mercy. 
And oh Lord, don't forget the young people this morning, Heavenly Father. They need you right now. Lord, put your strong arm of protection all around them. For that cause, we're begging thee to have mercy. And Lord, bless this government this morning, Heavenly Father. Bless it from the top to the bottom. Lord, they need you, Heavenly Father. We need for you to talk to them a little while, Heavenly Father. And we know if you do, Heavenly Father, everything will be all right. For that call, we're begging thee to have mercy. And Lord, when it's your time to call and my time to answer, that you give me a home somewhere in your kingdom. Service prayer. Amen.
Hallelujah. You ought to run. Go run and tell that. Satan, run and tell that. Yes, sir. God bless you. Thank you for our, uh, thank you first of all, to, uh, Brother Ephraim Bryant for that powerful prayer. And then thank you to our praise team, uh, Sister Washington, Sister Beeman, uh, Sister Sharon Holt Harris, Sister Rosalind Davis, and then Vicki Campbell, can't nobody sing quite like Vicki Campbell. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Amen. We are abbreviating the service just somewhat, so what we want to do now is to acknowledge your tithe and offering. Uh, so we, we're not going to do it on the screen today, so let me just give it to you. If you're giving by way of Givelify, that Givelify information is New Bethel AME Quincy. New Bethel, AME, Quincy, Florida. Amen. If you give them my way of Cash App, that information is cash tag New Bethel, AME, Quincy. Amen. And if you're old school, you probably already got the address, but let me give it to you anyway. Post Office Box 634 in beautiful Quincy, Florida, 32351. Amen. Amen. So let's pray over our offerings. And God, we thank you that no weapon formed against you can prosper. Don't mean they won't form. It does mean they can't prosper. So we bless your name. We thank you, Lord God, for the ability to give. Because you said in your word, it is better to give than to receive. So, Lord God, we pray in expectation that as we plant this seed, we don't have to worry about money because we got seed in the ground. That in fact, Lord God, you're going to use this seed, good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over to return into our bosom. We believe that and receive that in the mighty name of Jesus. Hallelujah and amen. Amen. I believe we're going now uh, to our... Um, Sermonic song, some, all right, uh, and that's going to be order my steps to your word, amen, and then we're coming back with the word of God.
That was a good singing right there. We want to uh, thank our praise team again uh, for that wonderful song. I love that song, Order My Steps in Your Word. Uh, old Mississippi Mass song, amen. All right, uh, I still need some of you to share. You're not very good evangelist today, but go ahead and share if you can on your phone or on your device. Go ahead and share with uh, other friends that you might have uh, that need to hear this word. Um, in fact, we're, we've been talking for the last two weeks now, and this will be the third week, about God has a plan. God got a plan for your life. Amen. In week one, week one, we talked about the principles of the plan, prioritizing, putting first things first, and making sure you got God as your number one. Amen. Somebody put in number one. Yeah. Hey, Sister Ruth Armstrong. Your number one priority ought to be God. 
that's the source and significance for all of our values, values like honesty and integrity. Amen. And then we talked about the world's value versus the values of the word. Amen. And when in doubt, stick to the word. And we too, last week, we talked about uh, God's blessing plan. God got a plan for you, and it includes blessing you. So God expects us to expect to have a blessing in our lives. We talked about that passage, uh, give and it shall be given to you. Good measure, press down, shake them together, run it over. So in order to get something out of life, you got to put something into life. Amen. Because what goes around, that's right. <laughs> We got some folk in the audience. They already answered that question. And yeah, so somebody type that in. What goes around comes around. That's right. What goes around comes the, the pathway to receiving is giving. Amen. Whatever it is you want, give and it shall be given to you. Good measure. Amen. Whatever you want to receive, you got to give that it to God to receive it from God. So you can partner with God. So if you want to know what my theology is on stewardship, you can go back and review that sermon. And I thank you for so many of you who already have. Amen. Sister Madden, Sister Brown, uh, Sister Jerry Washington. Uh, thank you so much. It looked like y'all viewed that several times, in fact. All right. And so today we're talking about God's plan, God's plan for our future. Won't you pray with me? And God, we just want to thank you in advance for what you're about to do in our lives. We want to be changed. We want to be transformed. And we definitely want to grow. We want, don't want to be the same tomorrow as we are today or as we were last week. So continue, Lord God, to work in us and through us that we might be a blessing to your people. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And for our sermon today... For God has a plan for your future. Amen. Okay, good. Somebody's already typing that in. God has a plan for your future. It comes right out of Jeremiah 29 and 11. And you've probably heard this passage many times before. Let me interpret it for you today. Uh, and in that passage of scripture, just one verse. Verse 11, Jeremiah 29. For I know the plans I have for you. This is God talking. I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. Amen. And I need my first responders. If you'll start out, God's got a plan for your future. Amen. One of the most difficult adjustments we have to make during the course of our years is recognizing that life is a testing and trying experience. More times than we may care to recall, all of us have found ourselves at the center of certain circumstances and situations, situations which we thought we could handle, but we find ourselves incapable of dealing with. Somebody thought they could handle it when their loved one died, but it rocked their world. They lost their sense of direction and have never gotten it together since. Somebody thought they could raise their children all alone, but they ended up having to sell a, a piece of their dignity for 30 pieces of silver. We thought we were strong enough to make it on our own, but the Lord had to show us that we cannot make this journey by ourselves. Somebody should have said amen right there. For a long time, mankind, we thought we were strong enough and smart enough and we had the attitude that we could handle whatever life sent our way. But no matter how strong or clever we might perceive ourselves to be, the sheer pressure of day-to-day -day living can drive all of us to our knees. There's a contrary something woven into the fabric of life that prevents us from, beset, from possession of its peace and its prizes without the agony of struggle and pain. 
I don't care how strong you are. Everybody has to cry sometime. Everybody fails sometime. Everybody has to bear burdens sometime. Everybody has to call on the name of the Lord sometime. Don't matter how strong you are, you can't make this journey without bleeding sometimes. It really hurts when we try and try and never seem to be able to get it together. It hurts to take one step forward and then two steps backward. It hurts to come to the tragic realization that our cherished hopes may never come true. Irrespective of our age or address, none of us can avoid life's pain. Amen. Somebody just type in pain. Yeah. And it's in the midst of all these painful experiences that the devil comes to the children of God and play mind games on us. And don't fool yourself, 21st century and all, the devil is real. We, we just experienced some of that on the internet this morning. If you don't believe it, you just keep on trying. Just keep on living, and the devil going to show up somewhere in your life. The devil will steal your joy, kill your dreams, and destroy your soul. The devil will send you to hell. The devil may be powerful, but God is all powerful. The devil may rule, but God super rules. The devil may be sharpening his weapons, but no weapon formed against you shall be able to prosper. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, I don't care what you say. The good news is that God knows about your circumstances. The good news is that not only does God know about your circumstances, God cares about your condition. And God not only knows about your circumstances, cares about your condition, but God can make a way out of no way. You can let the devil fool you, and you can let the devil rent space in your mind, and you can let the devil get you into a tizzy if you want to, but the bottom line is, is that God knows, God cares, and God can. We need to be reminded of this basic fact because we live in a world and we worship in a world where it's not possible to go around admitting that you hurt. Everybody now is into being blessed and highly favored. We are hung up on the outside, but hurting on the inside. We learn to look holy. We learn to act holy. We learn to fake it till we make it. But despite all of that, and despite all our high-powered praise, we wonder whether or not God knows where we are and what we're going through. And, and this is really what is happening in the background of our text today. God has allowed, somebody just texts in allowed, A-L-L-O-W-E-D. God has allowed the people of Israel to be carried away into Babylonian captivity because, the Bible says, because of their sin. I'll let that soak in for a little while. Their faith has faltered. Their spirit has grown faint. They are overcome with despair. They begin to wonder if they will ever see their homeland again. Jeremiah is the prophet, and he's busy trying to intercede on their behalf. And so God says to him, Jeremiah, you tell the people, I know where they are, and I know what they're going through, and the reason I know is because I put them there. And, and, and it's hard to face. It's hard to admit that sometimes we are in the situation that we're in because we left God no choice. God can keep on blessing us, and God can keep on giving us chances, and God can keep on giving us second chances to repent and to follow him. But sometimes, no matter what God does and what God sees us through, we openly defy his goodness and do our own thing. Be careful, my brothers and sisters, 
God is not going to wink at your arrogance forever. He knows how to put you in your place. Some of us are in the situation we're in because we left God no choice. And likewise, Israel was in their situation because they left God no choice. See, verse 17 of chapter 2, the New Living Translation says, and you have bought this on yourselves by rebelling against the Lord your God when he wanted to lead you and show you the way. And if you're honest about it, this morning, you, you, this afternoon, you will admit that you are in the mess you're in, not because of anything else. You're in the mess you're in because of your sin. Sitting there in the living room and even here in the sanctuary, hurting because of your sin. And I know the word sin is not popular in this new millennium. And I know this new age generation that the word sin seems old-fashioned and ancient. But you could call it whatever name you want to call it. You could think of it in any terms you want to think of it. But listen, sin is real. No, 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 no. Not only is sin real, but sin is sin. What I mean by that is sin if your mama do it. It's sin if your daddy do it. It's sin if you do it. Say what you want. But sin is real. Say what you want, but a whole lot of us in the situation we're in right now because of the sin in our lives. See here, you can't blame racism or the critical race theory for the mess you in. You can't blame the man for the mess you in. You can't blame the system for the mess you in. You're in the mess you're in because of who you're sleeping with. You're in the mess you're in because you won't stop hitting the pipe. You're in the mess you're in because you won't give up that bottle of yak. You're in the mess you're in because you think you're smarter than God and smarter than the word of God. You're in rebellion against God and God knows how to put you in your place. You're in the mess you're in because you're in spiritual rebellion. You're in the mess you're in because of the sin in your life. Israel's mess was a mess of their own making. They had made their bed hard, and like grandmama said, they got to sleep in it now. They were hurting. They were tired, and they were faint. And even though they had rejected the prophet of God, Jeremiah just kept on praying and kept on interceding on their behalf. And on one of those occasions, Jeremiah finally got a breakthrough. God reached over from his throne and pressed the button on his heavenly Zoom system and said, Jeremiah, what's happening, bro? I'm glad to hear from you. You know, I was just thinking about you. I was just pondering your plight. I was just meditating over your mess. I, I, I've been contemplating and considering your circumstance. I've been brooding over your bruises. I was just thinking about you. That's when verse 11 kicks in. For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, thoughts of peace and not evil, to give you an expected end. Now, these don't sound like the words of somebody that don't know what they're doing and, can't, and don't know the difference between can and can't. These sound like the words of somebody who is in control and got a plan. See, this is not passive thinking. This is not helpless thinking. This is thinking with a plan in mind. Peace and not evil to give you an expected end. And I don't know how you feel about it this afternoon, but that's shouting news to me. See, what that means is that God is thinking about you. Can you picture, if you will, God sitting in his throne in eternity, shrouded in imperial glory, and his mind could be anywhere at the infinite ends of the universe. His mind could flare off and create worlds of which our minds could not even conceive. 
And of all the things that could capture the attention and the mind of God, yet he's intentionally preoccupied with you. Yeah, just touch yourself and say, God loves me. Yeah, no, say it like it got some feel and the meaning and significance. God loves me. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, and you know, my brothers and sisters, your situation is the image that flashes across the media ministry in God's mentality. So on this Sunday afternoon, August 1st, 2021, if you don't get anything else out of this message, I want you to leave virtual church and this sanctuary knowing that God is thinking about you. <laughs> Hallelujah. He knows where you are. He knows what you're going through. He knows the desires of your heart. He knows your hopes. And in the midst of all of that, he wants you to know that he got you on his mind. He says, I got plans for you now. You, you may not know them, and it's not important that you do know them because I know them. I know the thoughts of you. You can't know them because you can't think on my level. My thoughts are not your thoughts, and my ways are not your ways. If you want to know the difference between your thoughts and God's thoughts, just go on on out there in the streets and look up at the sky. And it's about as much difference between the ground and the sky as it is between your thoughts and God's thoughts. God says here, I have contemplated your plight. I have devised a creative, constructive way to give you a future. And this is your rhema word for the day that God wants you to know that he is sitting in eternity right now and he's planning your future. Somebody should have shouted hallelujah right there. Anybody want to hear God's plan? Just type in the chat box. Just yell out, preach to me, pastor. Yeah. Okay, now come here and see that in the first lesson we learn is that what you're going through right now is a part of God's overall plan. Well, anything you're going through right now is a part of God's overall plan. Now, it may not be as we survey our situation that we can find any rationality, reason, or rhyme as to what God is doing in our lives. We can't find any explanation or justification for this pesky and prolonged pandemic which seems to be both persistent and protracted. We can't figure out all the heck we catching can be a part of some grand scheme or some master plan that God has. But it, but it isn't that God intended for you to be in the mess that you're in. God never intends for harm and evil and injury to come our way. God didn't intend for Israel to wind up in Babylonian captivity. But after he saw that they didn't know how to handle being blessed, he had to put them in their place. And, and even though he put them in their place, he still did not forget about them. He says here, I know the plans that I have for you. And God always has a plan for your life and for my life. See, a long time ago, he drew up a masterpiece of a master plan for your life. And he's trying to work it through you and through your life so that the problem, but the problem we keep on, uh, we keep on frustrating God's plan. He got a plan for you, but you keep on frustrating. Every time God blesses us, then we get funny. Loan some folks some money, and instead of being grateful, they don't even speak to you. Try to avoid you on the street. God blesses some folk with increase, and instead of thanking God by giving the tithe, they like act like God don't even deserve a tip. And every time God forgives you, then you go out and you want to do it all over again. God has a masterpiece of a master plan for your life. But he has, been, he has been put in the position of having to work through our mess to fulfill his plan. God didn't intend for you to be in the mess you're in, 
But since you've made such a mess out of it, then God got to use your mess and the mess that you made in order to fulfill his plan. That this is what we call God's circumstantial will. Amen. Some of my first responders, go ahead and put that in the chat box. C-R-R-C-U-M-S-T-A-N-T-I-A-L. God's circumstantial will. See, 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 it's God's intentional will that we fulfill the plan that he has from our life from the day that we were born, from the day that he formed us in our mama's womb. But God's circumstantial will is God at work in the mess that we made trying to get us to the point where he could fulfill the plan he had from us from the very beginning. See, this is what God is telling Jeremiah. Let Israel know that it was not my original intent that they be where they are. But since they are where they are, then I'm sitting here in heaven trying to figure out a way to work through their mess to fulfill the plan I have for their lives. And you know, my brothers and sisters, we can put God in some tough situations. All God ever wanted for us was to give us a sense of dignity and, and respect. And, and we've gone around and messed up so bad that the only place we can get some respect now is in the church. And we tempt in that with our shallow living and our lack of service. Preach, Rip. I'm already doing that. All God ever wanted for us was to bless us so we could bless somebody else. And we done gone and reneged on that plan too. Israel had messed up. But God said, I know the thoughts I have for you. I know the plans I have for you. I know you mess you in. But I'm thinking, of, I'm thinking about you. I'm applying some mental activity to your situation. See, some of us wouldn't be in the mess we in if we had just applied a little mental activity before we did certain things. God said, I know the thoughts I think towards you. Now, my brothers and sisters, this, this word think, it comes from the Hebrew word that has several meanings. In the first place, it is an accounting term. A-C-C-O-U-N-T-I-N-G. It's an accounting term that CPAs use. It means to assess the value of something. And what God is saying is that I'm sitting here trying to assess just how much you mean to me. You done messed up. You done fallen. And in spite of all you've done, I'm sitting here trying to calculate your value. I'm trying to tally up the total worth of what you mean to me. And let me tell you, your worth to God is not based on how you feel about yourself. Because some of us got low self-esteem. And some of us feel that we ain't nothing. And, and you're right about that. You really ain't nothing. But see, your worth to God ain't based on whether you tall or skinny or short or fat or whether you light skin or dark skin. It's based on the fact that whether you see anything in your life of value or not, God saw something in you that was worth dying for. God wants me to tell you this morning that you mean something to him, that he got plans for you, and he wants you to hang on in there and don't give up. So stop worrying. You, you don't deserve it, but God going to bless you anyhow. <laughs> That's shouting news right there. Secondly, this word think and thought uh, uh, has a military connotation. In the military, it means to devise a strategy that will secure a victory. Oh, boy, I can't always, oh, I'm, I'm, I don't got happy in my spirit now. It means to calculate the outcome of a battle. And God says this morning that he has already seen your future. 
See, in the circumstances you're in now, God, everything might look dark to you. You might already feel overwhelmed and defeated. But God is saying he's already devised a military strategy that will overcome the enemy and give you a life of victory. He says, so, uh, and he says he's so sure about it that you don't have to wait for the victory to come. You can go ahead and shout right now. If God has already conceived it, you're in faith, you ought to just move on it because you can shout before you even see the victory. Hallelujah. I wish I had some real soul like saints in here. God has already guaranteed victory in your life. So life, so shout right now. God has already determined the outcome in your favor, so shout right now. Even though you may feel down now, if you hang on in there, God is going to lift you up. Shout now. Thank you now. Hallelujah now. Don't wait for the victory to come. Shout now. And thirdly, in the third instance, the word thought also means to braid and to plait, to weave together like elements. Okay. See, see, it's a picture of the old artisans of the ancient world bringing together leftover and extraneous pieces of materials to make a rug. And see... We may not know much about rug weaving, but in this day and time, we do know something about hair weaving. Yeah. See, some of us know enough about that that we could start a weave ministry in the church. <laughs> and, and I don't know how much you know about this weaving, because I didn't know much, so I asked this young lady. She calls herself a, a cosmetologist. But when I was coming up, we just called them doing hair. You know, so I asked her, I said, what is this weave stuff all about? So she tried to make it simple to me. She said, well, it's just getting some live hair and then taking some real hair and, and, and then weaving it onto some dead hair. Yeah. And, and then uh, weaving that onto the live hair. So it gives you the immediate impression that you got a whole lot of hair. Okay, so, so what God is saying here is that he is weaving the various elements of your life together so that when he finishes, uh, then it's going to be a masterpiece. See, you look at yourself and others look at you and you don't appear to be blessed right now. But when God finishes weaving his life-giving stuff, with your old, dead, messed up, extraneous stuff, folk going to look at you, and they're going to be, all they're going to be able to say is, you look blessed. You, you, you look like the Lord done laid his hands on you. He's going to weave a masterpiece out of your messed up circumstances. And God will do it. Won't he do it? I, I don't care what you say. God is working it out. Lift up your head. Don't let the devil discourage you. God is assessing and God is calculating and God is weaving some stuff together to give you a future. And then finally, my brothers and sisters, and I'm going to close now, we must live in expectation of only the best. Now, we, we touched on this last Sunday about you should expect God to bless you. You should expect God to prosper you. Here's another take on that. We should live in expectation that God is going to give us only the best. See, see, God says here that I'm going to give you an expected end. In other words, what God has for you is for you. And you can expect it. God, God says, I'm going to give you a future and a hope, and you can expect it. You will have a wonderful future where you are now and not where you, because where you are now is not where you're always going to be. You can expect to be somewhere else because God says so. 
The problem is we don't know how to be blessed because we don't know how to live in expectation. See, see, every mama in his church right here and in the virtual church, you ought to be shouting right now because you know something about living in expectation. Uh, when I was growing up, a woman would get pregnant and folk would say, well, you know, so and so is expecting. Uh, that meant that she was in hopeful expectation that in nine months she would give birth to a bouncing, bubbling baby. And every mother knows that right before birth, they go into something called labor. And with this labor comes labor pains. But that labor pain is just for the moment and does not last always. God told me to tell you that your pains of labor are not going to last always. God said not to be weary in well-doing, for your labor in the Lord is not in vain. God is about to birth a brand new hope in your soul, and you can expect it. God says, I'm going to bless you, and you can expect it. God says, you might be in a mess right now, but I got plans for your future. Plans to prosper you and not faint. Plans for a future of peace and not evil. A future designed for your welfare and not for your harm. And you can expect it. Somebody just type in, I'm expecting, I'm expecting, I'm expecting. What God is saying is that we need to cultivate a life of expectation. See here, I walk around and I expect to be blessed. I expect a life of dignity. I expect the best God has to offer. I expect my cup to overflow. I expect goodness and mercy to follow me all the days of my life. I expect for God to walk with me and talk with me and then tell me I am his own. I expect when I fall, he'll lift me back up. I expect my enemies are going to leave me alone. I expect God will order my steps guide my feet, navigate my circumstances so I could give him praise just like he probably, I expected. Now, let me see if I can show you what it means to live in expectation. The Hebrew word used here for expectation is a Hebrew word called tikbah. That's T-I-Q-B-A-H. And that word tikbah Expectation means to row. Everybody just type in row. Everybody in church just say row. Like row, row, row your boat. Just a little bit louder. Row. Yeah. And the picture we get here is one of a rowboat and not of a motorboat. See, on a motorboat, you sit at the controls facing your destination and you guide and steer and control the motorboat towards your destination. I'm going somewhere with this. But in a rowboat, you sit with your back towards your destination. And there's a man called a, a, a coxswain, C-O-X-S-W-A-I-N, a coxswain. Now, under maritime rules, the coxswain is the captain of the ship and the master of the boat. We're all of my Invictus fans out there. The coxswain looks towards your destination for you, and he guides the boat while calling out the cadence for you to row. See, this, this makes it easy for you because all you got to do is row and trust in the coxswain to steer you in the right direction. You trust it every time the coxswain says, row. You just row. Don't worry about looking back because the coxswain is in the boat with you and trust him. You got to trust him to guide the boat. What, I, what I'm trying to say here is that Jesus is your coxswain. He's in the boat with you. And all you got to do is row. 
Row! Bless the Lord, oh my soul, and all that's within me. Row! Lift him up every time you get. Row! Serve him with gladness. Row! Expect God to bless you. Row! Because eyes have not seen, ears have not heard, neither has it entered into your heart. The good things God got planned for you. Row! Because my God shall supply all my need according to his riches and glory. Row! Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lead not to your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct your path. Row! Because I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. You can expect God to give you a good future and a bright hope if you row. Partner with God. Do your part because God is going to do his. At this time, we're going to open up the doors to the church. Ordinarily, we were saying, just come, and uh, I ruined my singing voice this morning. So, <laughs> amen. So I'm going to end I'm going to ask you to just come this morning. And the way that you could come, I'm going to give you a phone number. It's an 850 phone number. But the number is 296-7367. 296-7367. At that number, you can start rowing by typing in Jesus. If you want Jesus to be the coxswain in your life, if you want God to guide you and to lead you and to bring you to this future hope that he has for you, 296-7367, just type in, just type in Jesus. Amen. At that same number, 296 Seven three six seven. I need some first responders. If you'll put that in the phone, 850-296-7367. You could text to that number, join, J-O-I-N, if you'd like to join our New Bethel Church family. We'd love for you to be a member of our fellowship. I'd love to be your pastor. 296-7367. Type in Jesus or join. And our ministry team will get a hold of you. Amen. All right. Thank you so much. God bless you. We want to uh, transition now. Uh, so get your uh, cornbread and buttermilk. Get your Kool-Aid. Or if you already have your communion kits, we're asking you to get the communion kits. Get your communion kits out so that we can sanctify them. We can bless them. I believe they're going to play... Um, I know it was the blood at this time. Amen.
God bless you.